Hello everybody, Adam Parks here hosting another Receivables Info webinar. Today we're going to talk about tips for recruiting collectors and we're going to take it a little bit further. We're going to talk about recruiting in the executive side as well because we don't want to leave out any area of what it's like to try and find people in these new and challenging times for, for establishing and, um, and collecting your human resources for your business. For today's webinar, I have two very knowledgeable and experienced individuals coming to join us. We have Ryan Kazmark with PNB Capital Group, and we also have Susan Richards, who's joining us to talk about the recruiting side of the world. So just to kind of establish uh, your perspectives for our audience today, Ryan, could you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and PNB Capital? Yeah, I am the CEO, uh, managing member, uh, one of three partners. Uh, we began business in April 2004, it's been around 19 years, coming up on 20. Uh, it's been a long road, lots of ups and downs. Uh, went through the mortgage collapse in 2008. That was a couple of fun years. <laughs> Learned a lot. Um, we're used to economics up, up and down. It's a volatile industry. It's something you become accustomed to. Um, you know, now that we're accustomed to it, we're focused on other things. Uh, we have staff that handle those ups and downs now. Recruiting has been one of the largest challenges for us. And I think it's all the other agencies and agencies in Western New York watching, they're going to understand, you know, exactly what I'm talking about. Labor costs are up and uh, the talent pool has shrunk. And so we've, we've changed some of our processes and procedures to accommodate that. So I guess we can get right into it. Uh, probably want, unless you want to introduce uh, our other. Yeah. Let's um, Susan, could you tell everybody a little bit about yourself, how you got to the seat that you're in today and what you're up to lately? Well, I've been in the industry for 34 years, um, started at Allied Bond in collection, and then I went to NCB, leading there as chief operating officer. So hired lots of individuals, both from collector to executive. Um, now I'm in a startup in Florida, Cred Tech, uh, I've seen a lot going on in LinkedIn, and I'm directly involved with staffing um, as a part of one of my um, branches, if you would, or one of my partners are definitely in the staffing. So yeah, going to dive in and talk to you about what it looks like today. And, you know, listening to Ryan, I know we're dealing with a lot of uh, different challenges that we haven't dealt with in years. So we can talk about that. Well, I think this is going to make for an interesting conversation because there are a lot of changes that have come up and I think that each one of you has kind of found a different angle on how you're approaching the problem itself. And so as we have this conversation today, and for those of you that don't know me, Adam Parks, I'm the founder of Receivables Info, past president of RMAI, and the founder of a number of organizations through the space where I've done hiring both in the receivables management arena and also in organizations that support receivables management as well. And so interested to share some of my kind of insights today as well. Um, but one thing I want to point out for those of you that are watching us live today, if you have any questions, put those in the comments and in the chat. We would love to respond to questions, especially as we're talking about um, kind of some of the challenges that you may be facing in your organization. If you have anything that you want to share or ask, please feel free to leave those in the chat and we'll address those in real time as we're kind of going through our presentation today. We did prepare a deck, but we do it mostly to uh, keep our conversation on track and make sure that we've got a, um, an interesting storyline for you all uh, and making sure that we're conveying all the information that we discussed when planning for the webinar originally. So, you know, the first thing that we want to talk about is that cost of turnover. Right. So like in setting the stage about what recruiting is, is all about, let's talk a little bit about what happens when someone doesn't work out. Right. What now, now what, what kind of challenges are you seeing Ryan, when you're looking at bringing in the new recruits or, or new, uh, you know, teams that are going through training and then they just don't work out. Well, you, you invest capital in each individual that comes through the door, right? So you yeah. have a training cost, you have recruitment costs, you have management costs. You have exe some executive management, some administrative costs in the back here for processing. So we want everyone to make it. Unfortunately, that is not what's happening. It's never <laughs> really what's happened, but you know, things are tougher now than ever. And we've made a lot of adjustments and a lot of other agencies have as well. And I'd like to hear from them, you know, at the end of this to see what they're doing as well, uh, to combat some of these challenges. 
you know, from a recruiting and advertising cost standpoint, those remain constant, you know, regardless of right now we have a pedal to the metal. So, you know, we're using four different platforms to get our word out there in order to generate interviews. Uh, we're doing, you know, we're trying to do, uh, you know, 50 interviews a week. That's our goal. Uh, we don't wow. always get there. Yeah, but we don't always get there, but we try. So some weeks we're over that. You know, we're finding we have to schedule at least 50 just to get 20, 25 to show up. They don't show up. We do a lot of uh, virtual interviews now, you know, through Indeed. They have a nice little portal for that. We use that a lot. We use Zoom. Uh, some people don't have access to Zoom, but they have a hard time utilizing Zoom. Um, so we bring them in, but we like to screen them with a, a virtual interview first. And then we have a final interview that's face to face in the office. Try to keep that to 15 minutes. Uh, we do have a secondary manager come in to close the interview because we also find that, you know, you can hire bad candidates and that causes a lot of problems. You want quality candidates, you know, as many quality candidates you can get. You know, I've had past trainers who just want to fill seats, you know, and that doesn't work. We need quality people coming through the door. And so we have a two part checkoff process for that to make sure that management has approved every single hire. And that's something we added uh, fourth quarter of last year. So that we're getting more quality people. We're finding that people stay longer. We're not just trying to fill, you know, fill seats with bodies. So, but we're well, I, I think. I think you're on point when you talk about some of these costs, right? Because you've got the cost of bringing people through the door, right? Like you've got the cost of, of even getting to schedule those interviews. You've got any recruitment fees, which Susan, I want to talk, like I, I want to bring you into the conversation for that portion of it. You've, and, and then your time. Right. So when we talk about these executive costs, the time that you're spending in interviewing and that you're going through these meetings and decisioning and all of that, chances are you've got like two or three of your partner, right? Like there's two or three people involved in that, which is the most valuable time in your entire organization. Whenever you have to bring together your whole executive team to make a decision or even have a discussion. Now, is it costing you dollars? Yes, it's costing you salary dollars, but it's also the opportunity cost because great minds can be doing better things, right? And so when we have this cost of having to constantly go through and find new people, I think it does create some um, some new and unique challenges. Now, you talked a little bit about kind of the um, the funnel process here. Ooh, we got some good questions coming in. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think from a, a training perspective, you know, we invest a lot of time and money into training. We develop these programs, the process of having everybody sitting in the room and not only all of that, but how about the cultural decay, meaning, yeah. you know, the the morale challenges that you face when your good people are constantly surrounded by turnover. And right. so if you've got the peop- the person sitting next to them is different every week, I think that there's kind of a, a moral decay there as well. Now, Susan, from a, um, from a recruiting standpoint, what are you seeing in terms of the cost of turnover? Well, it's a little bit different. I mean, um, just listening to everybody speak like Ryan, I've dealt with exactly what he's talking about where, you know, the interview is done by management team and more from the operations standpoint, because that way um, you're getting a better hire because you know exactly what it feels like to sit in the seat of a collector. So that the manager knows if the person's going to be able to, you know, even the hours of a collector. So from a recruiting standpoint, it's totally different. We're incurring all the costs, right? So from the costs of what, indeed is and and all the price point that goes on with advertising we're doing that um so that's one thing that the company doesn't have to deal with and then when we vet the uh applicant out and we place them they still have 90 days so within that 90 days if i was doing this for ryan and he said you know what uh this isn't a key employee this isn't working you know he could ask me to replace that now, would we want to be replacing every 90 days? Of course not. Our goal is to get the right person out there, right? So um, so we, as a recruiter, you're going to get a little bit different. We're going to pick up all those costs. 
I, th I think that all makes a lot of sense. Um, we are getting a couple of questions about will you receive the electronic handout at the end? The answer to that is yes, you'll at the end of the session, you'll receive an email that has the video and the handout. Um, the video also gets reposted to YouTube on Friday so that you can watch it there or on LinkedIn through our existing channels. The second question was, um, uh, what four platforms do you use before you answer that? I know we covered that later in our discussion today. So yeah, I'm going to leave, yeah. I'm going to leave that one there for now, not to give away all the trade secrets, but I think a lot of us are using similar tool sets and we do have part of our discussion dedicated to um, kind of those tool sets. So now that we've established, you know, the challenge that we face as an industry, which is that cost of turnover, right? Finding, finding enough people to fuel our businesses, but also managing the, extraneous costs that come with the turnover that we all face um, across the industry and honestly across the economy at this point because I don't think the problems that we're having are unique just to receivables. Um, I think this is kind of a larger problem from an economic standpoint um, but we do have some unique receivables recruiting challenges right and I think that the our, our industry is, is very special and unique and there's some value attributes that can cross over and there's some great things that we can do. Um, but from an executive standpoint, Susan, let's talk a little bit about what some of this executive recruiting, you know, kind of um, is the challenges that we're facing as an industry and what's kind of unique to us, right? Because that like remote versus on site, I feel like from an executive level is something that we've, kind of dealt with in this industry for probably close to 20 years because when you're going for an executive you are trying to recruit some very specific experience and very rarely are you going to find all the experience that you're looking for in your hometown now ryan might be a little bit easier for you being in kind of a centralized location where there are a lot of receivables professionals but for susan and i in south florida it's not a heavy collector state so to speak so susan what do you you know, what are you seeing in terms of unique challenges or challenges that are unique to the receivables management space? Well, I don't know about unique. I'll say this, that, um, you know, a lot of people want to work remote and with an executive, um, people are all over the place now. So for example, you'll see different agencies advertising on LinkedIn, their new hire. Well, their new hire isn't located you know, local, nine times out of 10, they're somewhere else or in another state, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean before it used to be, we'd have to worry about somebody being right in your backyard and then worry about maybe that person um, moving, they don't want to move their family and all that stuff. So now this whole remote thing works. And then, you know, the, the executive goes through twice or maybe three times a um, sometimes twice a month, um, sometimes twice a week. It depends on the company, you know. Uh, unique to our industry, I think that there, um, I do notice a lot of people um, changing jobs a lot sooner than normal. Like before you would see people staying in positions for, you know, years and years and years. And now they're kind of saying, mm, I want to try something new. You know, I want to move into um a different space or i want to book the ladder especially if you're dealing with the c-suite i mean that's different then there's some other things that we can talk about like the fractional things that go into play that could work for um, companies that could get ideas from another individual that has the experience level of them. No, understood. So, I mean, for me, when I look at the receivables industry and kind of what's unique, I think one of those things that's unique is is the really small experienced labor pool. So like the the volume of individuals that are capable of stepping into, let's say, a COO role at a collection agency or a debt buyer, there, there's not 10,000 people out there to choose from, right? You're dealing with a very, very small experience talent pool and that's not to say that someone can't grow into that experience or you can't promote from within and you know i do believe that there are some options but i find that to be somewhat unique to our industry in that if i'm looking for for example um you know a product manager for a technology product like i've got a broad 
marketplace that I can reach out to and I could get somebody from a Microsoft or a Google or some small company, right? But like that, that role of being a product manager for a technology company and managing your developers and your product owners and your customers is something that is a transferable skill that comes across uh, a number of different industries. Whereas someone who has experience building specific dialer campaigns or specific digital email strategy campaigns is gonna be very different because that's a, a skill set that requires experience in our marketplace prior. And so I find that to be um, a, an interesting challenge. And when you've got such a small marketplace, Everybody knowing everybody, I think, creates another, you know, kind of unique challenge here because, I mean, you go into a conference um, looking for a job and your employer knows that you're out looking for a job like same day because it's such a small space and everybody knows everybody. So being able to fly under the radar and make moves with your career, I think, are more difficult as an executive in the space. Now, um, that might not carry as true for a collector because the customer service skill set right like that collector customer service kind of skill set i think is probably a little bit more transferable than having experience using a latitude by genesis or a particular collection software or a particular dialer right because our industry is so specific and then each organization within our industry tends to focus their time and energy on the products that they're using and it's somewhat transferable but not completely transferable which i think creates some really interesting challenges. Ryan, I can see you making some faces there too about kind of the non-transferableness of the executive side. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so we, we have failed at trying to hire uh, executive level positions from outside the company. Mm -hmm. so either we promote them within or what we've done lately and we just started about 18 months ago was we hired two new MBAs right mm -hmm. out of college uh, with a long vetting process to find the right fit. Um, Hal Jenkins and Jay Carey, and we are grooming them to take over certain high-level positions. They are not ready yet. We are being patient, and we are going to take a good two, three years, whatever it takes, until they can grasp a lot of these higher concepts. You know, we deploy a lot of APIs we built ourselves, a lot of processes, mm -hmm. computers, and softwares that we really built ourselves. And so, to plug play someone in there, it's just not possible. It takes years to learn what we're doing and how we deploy it. And the reason we're so successful is how we deploy it. And you're just talking about dialer. I'm the resident dialer genius here. It's taken me 19 years and I'm still learning. I'm still learning. <laughs> so to so you know, pass that baton to somebody else mm -hmm. uh, it's difficult because that's the driving force. That's the engine behind everything. We have other contact strategies as well, between text and email and other things, but and, all, and a lot of those engines, you know, I, I, I'm heavily involved in still as well. Even I'm not deploying them personally like I am Tyler right now. But I do want to pass that baton off, but I need someone that I know understands it the way I do. We're working a vast array of different inventories, specialty finance. All of these things take different dialing strategies to be successful. We have to deliver ROI to, you know, we own it, we have a debt purchasing company that, that I'm part of one of but we also work, you know, half our inventory is clients. We work direct for banks, mm -hmm. some lenders, and they have, you know, goals that we have to hit. And, you know, I take that very personally. You know, our ability to liquidate is paramount, and people come to us because they know we're going to get the job done. And if we're missing the ball, and I have one, just one client out there telling other people through word of mouth that, hey, they didn't hit our goal that travels around a small industry, I've learned the hard way. <laughs> I can't have that. We're goal hitters. We hit goals no matter what. And whoever we put in those positions has to understand that and has to has to follow the program. So and we change all the time. The program isn't one of those cookie cutter, you know, Lego programs. You know, we're constantly changing um, mm -hmm. daily. You know, there's there's nothing that's the same what i'm how i'm dialing last month is not how i'm dialing this month mm -hmm. that's so, right and that's that's part of the problem is how do you train somebody to make those kind of changes on their own it's well transferring way. knowledge is never easy and transferring knowledge at such a, a a finite and detailed level tends to be almost impossible because this is not it's 
how do I say it? It's a cross between the art and the science, right? You can transfer the science and here, you know, and you can talk to some of like you brought in new people and now you're teaching them kind of the science, but until they experience it for themselves, it's hard to transfer the art portion of it, right? right? Like the fact that you're making some decisions in your dialer strategies and things right. based on product, based on timing, based on the cyclical right. nature of our business on an annual cycle, right? You have all these things that you've developed in your mind over right. 19 years, but then how do you transfer that to somebody else without actually, uh, you know, bringing in somebody new? And when I first entered this industry, I worked for a gen- I was at Credit Max and I worked for a gentleman named Ed Forbes. And Ed literally dragged a desk into his office and sat it down. It was like, you sit here. And I'm like, well, and I was a fresh MBA. And I'm like, well, what, do you, what do you want me to do here? And he's like, just sit there, shut up and listen. And I was like, okay, so I guess I'm going to sit here and listen for the next few months. But I learned an incredible amount just listening to him on the phone and him taking a lot of calls on speaker. I learned the names of all the key players. I learned about those key players. I learned about their core businesses. And I was sitting there building a CRM at the time and taking notes in the CRM, right? Like what products do they like to buy? What balance ranges are they looking for? And trying to understand all of that. That was a quick way for him to transfer knowledge over to me and for me to run with it. Sounds like you're very much on the right path in terms of that executive uh, transfer of knowledge and bringing in, you know, fresh uh, people with a business mind frame that you can show the ropes to. But I think your timeline is accurate too, because the level of finite detail that you're ultimately looking for is going to take two to three years to transfer that knowledge. And that might include a couple of, of steps up for them from where they're starting because you want to continue to motivate those people as well. But it sounds like you're on to a pretty creative um, approach to the problem. Hope it works out. It, they've been progressing very well. I've delegated a few things. They're, they're you know, we have meetings every week. Uh, they're doing well. I feel like this is the solution. Uh, follow up with me next year and I'll let you know. Uh, but I feel like this is the way to go. This is the way. Um, you know, after 19 years of, of doing things wrong, it's how you learn trial and error, right? So mm-hmm. uh, we, gave, we gave up on hiring from outside uh, for those positions. And I feel like this is the way to go. And I hope I'm right. I feel like I am. We're progressing towards getting there. We just need to keep moving forward. And that's pretty good. So let's talk about it a little bit from the collector's perspective, right? And what are, you know, what unique challenges do you have in taking on new collectors? What are the, some of the challenges that you feel like you're facing when you're out there trying to get new collectors? So what you mentioned earlier about 10 minutes ago, uh, the mentality of having a new neighbor sit down in the cubicle next to you and they're gone in two weeks. Mm-hmm. We, we've been able to minimize that. We've learned uh, also the hard way. Um, you know, that, that kind of mentality, you know, my, my one partner calls the cancer, right? The cancer mm-hmm. that spreads to the office. We want to keep the cancer. We almost want to quarantine it away from our veteran workforce. Mm-hmm. And so we have a two part training process. We deploy an advanced training system, which is a lot of other issues deploy. It's not rocket science it's not some secret sauce uh we have two training classroom training and then we have a month of advanced training the advanced training is where we weed out people that can't conform people that don't follow process or procedure that aren't compliant on the phone and then we also weed out people that can't can't perform can't close you know there's lots of people like to talk well on the on the phone call but they can't close and they just can't you either have it or you don't and a lot of it comes from a cost standpoint. We have to identify these individuals very quickly and, and rotate them out to get them off our payroll to keep our costs down. Because we leave them on the payroll, hoping they're going to make it 90, 120 days. You know, my, my CFO has showed me the numbers. of throwing away half a million, three quarters of a million dollars every year mm-hmm. if we're not rotating them out fast enough. But at the same token, we don't want to rotate them out, they don't, them out too fast. So there are some people that learn at different rates and mm-hmm. identify those people that we know are working hard and they put some effort in. They have the capacity to learn and they're following process procedure. They're a company man. They're drinking the company Kool-Aid. These are the people we want to you know, circle the ragas around and work with. And if it takes longer than, than 30 days in advanced training, particularly, you know, we hire right now in a ratio of one to five. So, but mm. 20% of the people we're hiring have prior collection experience in the receivables field. The other four-fifths do not. 
but they have a transferable skill. Either they were selling cars or they were a waitress. We find waitresses work out very, very well. Or they're in some other sales capacity. These are the people that oftentimes take a little longer to grasp some of these things. You know, there's more laws you have to learn than ever before and memorize. Different things you have to know from Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Indiana. Uh, and we have cheat sheets and little things in you know the computer area to help them with that, but you really didn't know this stuff cold. We have testing for that. Yeah. The position is not as easy as it used to be a decade ago. It's a lot harder. So it, it you know that strains us a little more too. The position is, is isn't as easy. So you know we work with these people. I'll extend it out if we identify them and we have staff meetings for this. And sometimes I'm involved. I have a, a business partner, Don, who personally oversees that. Yeah. And we'll extend them out to 120 days, even if they're not hitting yet, even if they're not covering your seat costs. We'll extend them out if we see the potential there, uh, if we think it's worth it. If we don't think it's worth it, then we rotate them out. And this is the process that we've learned over the last three years. It's critical to keeping our costs down by maximizing uh, retention and minimizing turnover. It really is. It's, you want to you know, churn the people out as fast as possible that you know aren't going to conform to policy and procedure. And you want to retain the people that are, but then you know you can forecast, okay, you know, if they're going to be able to cover the steep cost and be a productive member of the company, you know, in, in, a, in a very recent time frame. So you said a couple of really interesting things. So one of the things that you were talking about was kind of that transferable skill set. And it sounds like sales was one of those key value attributes that you're identifying as a transferable skill. And you said it like, you know, those that were selling cars and someone who sold cars, like I, yeah. sales, absolutely. Um, but even waitress, and I think a lot of people don't view waitress as a sales job, but I do because yeah. we, like being a successful service person is going to come down to your ability to upsell. Are, and, and that upsell is, it might even just be making sure they are, are you offering coffee and dessert? Are you offering sides when they order an entree? Like it's those little things. And if they've got those value attributes, that does feel like a very transferable skill from a collector standpoint. Now, Susan, from your perspective, you know, what do you think are some of those transferable skill sets, um, you know, to finding good collectors? Yeah. So uh, from a recruiter standpoint, most agencies wouldn't use them for a collector as much. But I'm going to say in the last three years, I was with several different shops, big ones, enough to see a whole different uh, view on hiring. So, for example, mm -hmm. where I came from, we only hired experienced collectors. Well, that's mm -hmm. really hard. And we would get referrals from, you know, collectors would have like, we'd have a referral program, right? And sometimes that's good. And sometimes that's not good because you may be getting people with bad habits. So mm. if you asked about different personalities. Absolutely. I agree with Ryan all day long. Salespeople are the ones that are really good on the phone. Don't mind working extra hours. Don't mind. Uh, they like to you know, resolve an issue and it's a win for them when somebody's paying them. So, um, and they have a little bit of a competitive side to them. Um, I think from a waitress, you're getting a customer service person. Um, I used to walk into, when I was uh, at NCB, I'd walk in Walmart and I would be getting things for like our incentives and immediately the girl at the check, where do you work? What do you do? Oh, what does this for? Oh, can I come, uh, you know, you know, apply. And if that person was super friendly and somebody who had a really good attitude, I'd be like, yeah, come in, you know, come on in. And I think that it depends on the organization, but some are, um, I used to believe that it was only experienced people would be a very, um, profitable, not so much. You bring in a, uh, somebody who's never done this before and teach them a craft. Um, they get really good at it if they have the right, if they have the right attitude. So, yeah. I, I like what you said there, teach them the craft, Yeah. right? Like that's, that's such a key attribute to this because, you know, perfecting the craft of being a collector is just that it's a craft, it's a skill set, um, And it's something that is, um, I, I think very closely tied to sales, which uh, ultimately can provide for opportunities. But now let's talk about where we can find some of these people. And back to the question we had in the chat earlier about kind of those four 
key pieces or platforms, and I'm sure, Ryan, that you've got more, and maybe you want to keep them secret, or maybe you want to toss them in you know, here. So Don already told me, he's like, I know you're going to give away our secret sauce. He's like, just try not to give them too many details. It's not that it's, I'm like, Don, it's not secret, you know, really. Fair. So a lot of the stuff is. Fair, but as, as you talk about executive versus, you know, collector staff, you know, are these some of the sources that you're using to identify and recruit good people? Well, you know, for the, the two uh, MBAs that we hired, uh, I used Indeed for that, just a, okay. a well-written ad on Indeed, and, and mm -hmm. we spent months vetting. Uh, we just took our time for that. It was, we were in no rush, and we're still not mm -hmm. in any rush. The whole, like I said, two to three years. So there's no rush there. Now, when it comes to the collection staff, uh, you know, we are deploying four different platforms uh, right now. Indeed, of course, it's our backbone, Zip Recruiter. Uh, we're in the Western New York area. We use something called Western New York Jobs. Mm -hmm. I still do relatively well with Western New York Jobs. And they say Western New York Jobs, it reaches people that are less tech savvy because they have actual printed papers still. And they're in mm -hmm. receptacles and they're placed throughout all of Western New York and they're free. People grab these things. And then we also deploy, you know, we're doing mailbox mailers, you know, we're hanging up mailers with tariffs and we're getting actually better response out of that than I could ever imagine. And we have people that go around, you know, we pan the side that stuff mailboxes with these mailers. And we're in an area, we're in West Seneca, New York, and we are, West Seneca has an aging population that most of the people here are near retirement or at retirement. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of these people will tell their grandkids, hey, you got this mail, are you looking for a job? And they call them, you know, we're getting probably 10%, 15% of our recruits come from the mailers. Um, we, we put signs up wherever we can. We have uh, a brand new sign we just came out with two months ago. Uh, our recruiter goes around and puts these signs up at intersections. Uh, we have, uh, we actually painted a huge sign right at our office. We got two walk-ins yesterday <laughs> off of that. Okay. Uh, we're, we're trying to deploy as many different angles as we can. You know, the, the online angle is, is still our, our best, but there's a lot of gold out there, you know, from the other angles we're finding that, you know, we really haven't looked into. We had a set it, forget it kind of thing three years ago. We're out of that now. You know, now that Don is personally overseeing this and making changes and trying new things, these are some of the things that we're trying that are, are yielding enough results for us to determine, okay, they're worth to keep doing. And so we're, we're still doing them. Um, you know, we, we, we do deploy a referral bonus, like Carl mentioned, um, and we're constantly changing that. And we have a new one now. We feel like it's working rather well. But we also deploy, you know, we, we put a little pressure pressure on them because people get complacent and they forget there's a bonus there. You have to remind them all the time, hey, you know, it's $500 and six, you know, within the 250 up front. And if they make it 60 days, you get another 250 hmm. So, you know, we I like that too. That, yeah. that, in, that incentivizes like this coaching opportunity. Well, bring in quality. Give us, yeah. give us quality candidates so they're going to make it 60 days and, and be placed on a team, get through advanced training, you get another two bit. So, you know, we've done three months before where we say they make it 90, we did another kicker. We're finding out that no one wants to wait 90 days anymore. People want instant gratification. That's why we have the front end kicker, 250. But this is constantly in flux. This is what it's been for the last 90 days. I'm assuming June, July will probably change again. But uh, it, we're getting some results with that. And the people we generally get referred to that program are usually quality people because mm -hmm. it's a friend or relative. It, it, for whatever reason, they come in and they'll make it through training. They'll, they'll get through advanced training. They'll get on the floor. And we, probably 30% of them will get to see cost. And, and we'll turn them into a veteran, um, which is still higher you know, at the 120 day mark than someone from Indeed. It's still better. It's still, it's still a good resource. Well, it sounds like you guys have found some, in, some interesting ways to fill what's called the top of the funnel, right? And then right. we'll talk a little bit more about that interview process and how you're refining those people that are coming down your hiring funnels. Um, but being able to fill the top of the, uh, the fill the top of the funnel is incredibly important. Um, I know for for me, Indeed has, has been a, a useful tool, although Indeed went through some changes to where I used to pay for an ad and that was great, right? Then I had all my leads come in, I was able to work through those leads and then they changed from a to a qualified submittance 
fee. Um, I ran one ad. I want to say it was going to be like five or six thousand dollars. And because I had not refined my acceptable parameters well enough, I ended up spending an entire day. I think it was about eight hours that I went through just denying bad applicants um, because I just got hit with this wave of probably a few thousand overnight. But because my criteria was not tight enough, I didn't want to go paying five grand for unusable leads. Um, and so I did find some challenges there. I preferred the advertising methodology through them significantly because it allowed me to better control costs and to more accurately and provide me with a longer time period than just whatever it was, 24 hours to deny these applicants or pay for them. But at $8 a resume, if the person has none of the qualifications, I mean, we were hiring for like writing positions and getting people that, you know, have no writing experience or you know they were they they're working at Walmart now or whatever, but they just weren't a fit for the skill set and the uh, the the mental tools that were ultimately needed for those positions. So I found some challenges there. I did find some solutions to those challenges on LinkedIn. Um, and so from an executive standpoint, as I'm hiring above my um, kind of my base level, uh, you know, Glassdoor is a great resource to use. But LinkedIn and headhunting on LinkedIn is been really good for me, um, finding people, uh, you know, that were looking for new positions and then even seeing how I'm connected to them and being able to reach out to other people that are connected with them to see if they might be a fit for our very unique organization, for our very unique industry. Um, and then Susan, people like you on the recruiting side, right, with the opportunities to reach out to someone and say, look, I need a superstar. I'm looking for these attributes. What do you have you know, in your stable right now. Um, so what's your experience been like from your perspective? Well, I have to, you know, with ComServe solutions, I have to keep the secret sauce secret, <clears throat> obviously. Sure. But what I will tell you is all the things you talked about, indeed, you know, LinkedIn are things said, but from a different standpoint, we have people already looking uh, we go after people on linkedin like you said we're looking for that specific spot and we feel we could do it uh exactly especially for executives we can do it a lot quicker in the fact that we have all the uh engines i guess you want to call it all the uh um you know recruiters across the nation that'll go in looking specifically for what your your needs are and even though it's a small knit group like you said with um our industry we kind of get to know people i mean i can't tell you how many times i'll get um you know an in mail on linkedin hey i'm looking for a job hey if you have anything or you know they have the little uh you know looking for a job thing you know mm -hmm. um so and for us we look at are you hiring those kinds of things we we check into but we have um a ton of filters out there looking for people because like i said the uh, Somebody wants to come to us for an executive, we want to turn it around in a very timely basis. That's why they hired us to go get that person and they want those specifics. And, you know, we want to try to get them. We're going to do some interviews and then we go ahead and hand them the best possible mm. candidates as soon as possible. Like within a week, we want to try mm. to, you know, we want to try to get that out that quick. So one other thing that we talked about from a recruiting standpoint was department specializations. And I think this is an interesting piece of understanding how, why to recruit and stepping away a little bit from the collectors, but operations, executive management and information technology. And I just wanted to touch on this briefly because in my experience, and I'm interested to hear if anybody else has a different experience, but operations is one of those things that is very laser focused industry specific because you have to understand all of these different tool sets, you have to have a deep understanding of the rules, regulations and laws. Um, and that kind of puts us in a unique scenario, but executive management and depending on what kind of a role you're talking about, a CFO can come from outside the industry and understand our space quite quickly. Um, so I do think that from an executive management standpoint, those that have led other organizations are very capable of leading those in the receivables management space. The biggest detractor from going outside for executive management is the lack of existing relationships. And that's not to say that they can't go hit a couple of shows and get to know some people, but you know, a lot of us have been around this space for 20 plus years, 
right? And so the deep relationships of all the different cities that we've all visited together and the different adventures that we've had while being stuck in an airport in Denver or whatever, um, you know, really does build to that camaraderie and I think does kind of change the dynamic and enable some executives to exceed others just based on having those relationships, whether it be with competitors, vendors, clients, whatever, but those relationships really do matter. And that's hard to replicate from the outside. And to Ryan's point earlier is something that you're going to have to learn. Now, this to me is, is one of the more interesting nuanced pieces, which is the information technology. And what we mean by that is, you know, an understanding of your system of record is one thing, but an understanding of basic network technology is something else. So I find information technology to be one of those unique things to where depending on how your database is structured and you know if your IT guy can write SQL queries and your system of record has an SQL backend, then that's probably gonna tie together quite nicely. But I'm curious to hear your thoughts on hiring or recruiting of information technology professionals in our space. Who are you asking? E either one, both of you. Ethan, you can take that one. What's that? You can take that one. Oh, I'll come in after you. Well, I mean, information technology. So I know we talk about, you talked about like our niche in the collection world, but this particular, I mean, you can go broad. There's so many different companies coming into this space. It isn't even funny. So, you know, when they, and everybody's got so much stuff when it comes to AI and how they see things, it really though depends on the particular agency that you're dealing with though. What do they have? So, for example, um, you know, some agencies are very old with their networks, right? They don't have new technology. Well, from a technology, and I'll speak for my son, he's Mr. Tech. When you're coming into a company that has very uh, archaic operations, because that's what they've done for 30 years, it's difficult to bring somebody in that's new, with, you know, that's in today's technology, because mm -hmm. first off, they, they, struggle with they, they know what they know they know what they went to school for they know what the new the, like they're interested in the best and if technology is the kind of thing that you're always looking for something better right so yeah. they want to know they want to be around really smart people that are um going into it going into things with a forward thinking so um i think that you don't necessarily it's not all going to be this industry but what you struggle with is you really have to, from my perspective, sit down with the agency and find out really what's their platform, because that's mm -hmm. going to end up on how to match that right individual with the platform. I think that's a, a very interesting perspective. And it kind of brings us to our uh, next topic uh, here, which is you. talking a little bit about the remote versus in office experience. And I know over the last three years, things have changed and different organizations look at remote versus in office work very differently. And I think organizations to further refine that identify a difference between remote executives and remote staff. And I think from a remote executive standpoint, that's something that the industry has been engaged with for many, many years because of the level of expertise and the lack of everybody being in location. If we were all in Atlanta, Georgia, it would be a lot easier, but we're not, right? We're all spread out around the country. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, Ryan, from your perspective is, is remote work something that you have ever utilized for either executives or staff? Uh, all the executives have remote access because they want to check the KPIs at night. They want to see what we did during the day. They want to check the RPC rates. They want to see this penetration. These are some of the things I'm teaching my new guys. This is how we make our adjustments to dialing the next day, especially if we're working the same accounts the next day, which we often don't, but if we do, we want to make and deploy those changes. Uh, I want them to be able to see those numbers at night at home so I, they have remote access. I think it's critical that they have that. Our salespeople have remote access, of course, because they're out and about and they need remote access. That's how they do their jobs, the scope of employment. Uh, from a collector standpoint, of course, when the state was shut down, we had to deploy remote access for them. We did that, you know, like every agency did. Uh, now that we're, you know, we're back again, a lot of our clients are very happy to have on-site staff that review their, their consumer data here. 
because we pass these audits, they're happy with our security and controls. They don't trust, uh, more than half of my clients do not trust our remote staff viewing their accounts, working their accounts. Even if I deploy cameras, I have the ability to key log, I can, I can check every keystroke, I have some to monitor their every move, it still isn't good enough for some of them. Mm -hmm. So we've, you know, we went right back to an on-site collection staff. We're 100 percent on site, and for now, for the foreseeable future, we're going to be sticking to that. But uh, yeah. understood. Now, Susan, like you've been a remote executive um, historically, you want to talk a little bit about what that is and like what that means from your perspective? Yeah, sure. Um, well, Brian said a lot of things. Uh, reminds me of all the KPIs and things that you look at an executive, your home, your your uh, even though you're home, you're watching like numbers. And um, I wouldn't say I was sitting there watching collectors uh, 24 seven because I didn't have that timeline, but management was on um, multiple screens. You know, they were looking at their people. Um, so being at home, um, there's pros and cons. I, I sometimes like being in an office where I can see people and we can sit down and talk about strategy. I, I love I didn't mind going in the office, being at home all the time. You, you know, there are some challenges with, you know, you have to constantly stay focused. You know, for an executive, I don't think it's as hard. I think a collector, it could be tough because you got a lot of different distractions that are going on. Um, and I know that there's different performance levels there. But um, from my perspective, for me working from home, um, there's pros and cons. Some like I said, I, I'm at home all the time now and I kind of love it. But before I have to tell you, when I had the opportunity to go in the office, I did like going in. I did like to see people just because I don't like being, I'm not, I'm not an introvert. That's why I go out and do sales too, because I'm not that person to sit. Uh, I, I'm just not. Well, look, I, I'm, I'm the work from home type most instances. Occasionally I go into the office and I do my work from there, but I do like working from home because it allows me to stay focused for longer periods of time. I think it also might just be a function of, of kind of riding the wave when you're getting good work done and knowing when to step away. But I do have to keep everything separate and apart, meaning like when I walk out of this room, I'm not working, right? Like I, I had to create separation for myself and I think executives have that capability, whereas, staff may not have that same level of mm -hmm. mental discipline to manage themselves through that process. Um, we did just have another question come through. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. Thoughts on resume searches and alerts on Indeed. So what I'm gonna do is kind of jump ahead two slides here so we could talk a little bit about the interview process, but also kind of address this question here. Um, from my perspective, resume searches and alerts can be a valuable tool set if you have the resources by which to dig through those resumes. So I do like to put out those applications and I do like to try and get people coming to us, um, but it also depends on the type of, of of position that I'm hiring for. If it's something that I'm looking for, kind of laser focused information technology type skill sets, I may go out and do those kinds of searches. But I think when it comes to recruiting collectors, I'm less likely to spend that executive time digging through piles and piles and piles of resumes, which I have historically done throughout my career. But I, as I've started to value my own time differently over the last, let's call it five to 10 years, I kind of pull back from the dig unless I have somebody on staff who's dedicated to that process. How about you guys? What, like, how do you feel about going, like trying to draw in resumes through recruitment versus, you know, going out and digging through the piles of resumes available? We, we've tried it both ways. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been semi-successful digging. It's just enormous from a time spent uh, standpoint, tons of time. It takes a lot of time to dig through. I know there's a query function in Indeed, and if has a query function, you can try to refine your candidates down, but it just doesn't boil them down enough. Mm -hmm. Once you have them refined down, the list is still massive. And it still takes a long time to dig through. We find it more cost-effective to, and, and from a time spent standpoint as, as, as well, to let you know don't cast such a wide net like you mentioned where you get five thousand candidates 
and none of which qualify. We want to, you know, cast a narrower net. And mm -hmm. that's one of the things that we're always adjusting to, because like you said, Indeed is always changing. And what could happen is you could have a $10,000 bill a month because they changed some of their, you know, some things in there that you weren't notified about and you have all these candidates that don't qualify. So we're, we're constantly refining that uh, to make sure that the net isn't too wide and isn't too narrow either because we've done that. We've had the net too narrow and we don't have enough applicants. And so that, that's always under refinement and always under adjustment. But I think that if you set it up so that they're identifying the, app, the applicants, they're applying and they're set up because they have shown interest and want to interview. Those are the ones that, that that system seems to work better for us. That's what we've been stuck with the last 24 months. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have tried it the other way where we did a lot of digging and it, we didn't fail at it. We did find some good people. We did fill some training classes. It's just more time consuming. That's all. Well, I think it's a it's a time consuming issue and then it's a, a selling issue. And what I mean by that is now I've got to convince someone to come be a debt collector. Right. When they've taken that first step towards applying for that position, they, they already have at least some understanding of what that role is going to be. Um, but if they if we're just reaching out and saying, come be a debt collector, I find that to be a little bit more of a hill to climb. I'm not saying it's impossible. And clearly you found some success through that channel. Um, but for me, I've, I find it to be a little bit challenging to be reaching out to people and, you know, saying, come, come be a debt collector. Now, at the executive level, the information technology level, I find that to be a little bit different. And those departments, I think it's easier to bring somebody into a financial services firm because their day to day job is going to feel more financial services. But a collector is going to be a collector. Right. And so if I have to reach out to those individuals and say, come be a debt collector, I just find it to be a little bit more challenging than um, than than putting those ads out there and trying to find interesting ways or hooks to entice people to come and participate. Um, any insight into kind of how. You know, I know you're not gonna have an exact number on hand, but the the volume of people that work out through a search versus the volume of people that work out through like recruitment advertising. Was there like a big difference? I, I know I know it's kind of a loaded question, but was, did you find like a big difference between those two worlds? Yeah, I mean, proportionally, if you look at our entire list of applicants and where we're mining those mm -hmm. uh, sources, uh, it's probably 65% of our applicants are coming from Indeed. And I would have to say if Don was in here, he'd probably give me an exact number like that. <laughs> Fair. Uh, but it's, 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 it's more, it encompasses more than half of all the rest of our sources. Mm -hmm. Right. So. And, but you're focused on that from a, uh, like from a recruitment advertising standpoint you're also directing people to the indeed profile for application which kind of goes into how are you managing the process and it sounds like you guys are using some of the tool sets that are baked into a tool like indeed to manage the application process yeah, we don't want the net too wide so we want to have them at least semi-qualified and uh -huh. we've learned through trial and error not to over qualify because you don't get enough applicants under qualify and then you're wasting your time and so we feel like we have a good recipe right there now uh we're getting good people in the door and of course we do our virtual to screen out mm -hmm. a lot of the people that didn't really fit the qualifications that they portrayed on indeed and then you know once we get through the virtual they come in from the face to face usually we've, we've ruled we've ruled out a lot of the the, the candidates we know aren't going to be successful here right off right off the go so you know and they have those that like you said if you, people that don't have the experience they all it comes down to can they conform or can they close so, you know, and we won't know that until they come through. We can process them two weeks, classroom training, one week, advanced training. We won't know any of that until we pump them through the system. Until they've had a chance to actually go through it. You know, for us, in terms of the interview process, one of the tools that I've used is Zoho Recruit. And the reason I use that tool is because my company is on the Zoho One platform. So our CRM and a lot of our tool sets, our HR management, all of that is kind of baked into this Zoho tool set. And there's a connection between a tool like a Zoho recruit. And you could look at a thousand different recruiting tools. And I know, Susan, you've got one that you've 
become more familiar with as well. Um, but the Zoho Recruit tool has worked out really well for us because it allows us to put up an application on our website. It also allows us to collect these applications directly through Indeed or um, other job sites where we have all this information coming together and then we've got kind of our process baked in. And just like we talked about kind of a, like if you're talking about a sales or a lead funnel, we've got our recruitment funnel, right? That goes from, you know, first application all the way through hired and onboarded and every stage in between. And we're enabled to kind of look at that process, make sure that we're staying on top of the responses. And then we also can start to find as we accept and reject candidates over time, we can start to leverage some of the tool sets within the platform to help us um, shorten the timelines for which we can evaluate these types of tool sets um, because everybody looks good on a resume, right? Like there's a thousand re chat GDP writing resumes now and all of that, like everybody looks good on a resume, but being able to start to find some of those specific attributes that either make or break a successful um, person can have a fit. Um, but one other question, you know, kind of we only got about three minutes left. Have you guys ever used personality tests um, yes. to try and identify those that would be successful to roll. Yes. We, yes. We've tried several. Uh, <laughs> some success. We've had people, you know, be very frustrated and can't get through it. And we, we actually did, we used to held it to the side. We had a control group and we had the tested group. Mm -hmm. And we found that it was ruling people out that would have been successful here. And so we kind of mm -hmm. cut it loose. I like the concept though. I do think in theory it would work if the testing was specifically tailored for our industry. Which a lot of it isn't. You know, they, yeah. they kind of categorize us with sales. Um, I think if they could refine it more, I really think in theory, I think it could be successful. I do like the, the idea of it. We tried two different companies that came help, uh, highly recommended a few years back and we pushed it really hard because we believed in it. It just didn't work out for us. How about you, Susan? Well, going back to when I was at NCB, we did that. Uh, collectors loved it. They loved finding out their personality. And then it also helped us figure out personalities. It wasn't like um, for that particular position, it doesn't take, uh, I could kind of figure out the type of person that it takes to sit in that seat. Because I mean, when you sit there and to your point, when you've gone through it and you've been in it, you know, you know what kind of personality can uh, make it like, for example, a construction guy. I've had mm -hmm. them come in a million times saying, you know, it's winter. I don't want to sit out in the snow anymore. I want to sit at a desk job. They never make it. <laughs> they <laughs> never make it. Come back to some, they're right back out. Yeah, I can't stand sitting all day. So, yeah. um, you know, but the personality test, yeah, it was fun. Um, I would say that we used it long term. I mean, we just did it as a, you know, a tool to see, but mm -hmm. it wasn't anything like rocket science. It kind of fit. It was kind of like what we expected, you know, the kind of employee that we expected, you know, so. So I, I recently went through an exercise on a consulting engagement with an entire executive team who took the personality test. I also took the same personality test. And I thought it was funny because the first line of my evaluation literally said, Adam will make friends with every client. And I thought that was the funniest thing I had ever seen on an evaluation because I was literally sitting in an office full of my executive friends that had hired me. They were my clients <laughs> and we were all going out to dinner after the test, which I just found to be incredibly accurate. Um, but I think that when you look at the personality test, one of the things that I've found is generally if you can find the personality tests that are running kind of a, a 360 evaluation and we find that this is our most successful band. This is our, you know, acceptable band in terms of those personality traits that fit. I've found that to work at a higher level, but have not yet fully vetted and tested that at a lower level. Maybe if we do a follow up on this discussion next year, I will have some more data for you because we are looking to deploy that same personality test across an entire organization to give us a better baseline. We're willing to make that investment because we were able to see from an executive standpoint what 
was what success looked like on the personality exam by evaluating the individuals that were already there and what their test results came back as. Are we going to use it as the be all end all? Of course not. Right. But I think if it can give us more indications, the money that we spend on going through that type of testing up front will help us reduce the cost of turnover, which is kind of where we kick all of this discussion off today. Well, just breaking past our hour uh, for this webinar, I want to thank both of you for coming on and having this chat with me. I think both of you came at this with some really unique perspective and added value in your own ways to this discussion. For those of you that are watching, if you have additional questions, you'll be able to leave those on YouTube or LinkedIn on Friday when we post the final video here for everybody to see. Also, please like and share so that we can spread this great information information out to more of the industry. But until next time, guys, thank you so much for joining me. Can't wait to do this again with you. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. All right, guys. We'll see everybody again soon.